Michael, thanks for joining us for a little chat here. Um, Good to be here. Cool. I mean, so this is an interesting week to have you on stage. Amazon just hit a trillion dollar market cap. Like, when you see that kind of success that they have really, you know, as it's accelerated over the past year, like, do you see Fanatics as something that's going to grow alongside them or directly kind of take them on and challenge them? Yeah, so for me, I think I give a lot of credit to where Fanatics is going to the success of Amazon. And the reason I say that is when I bought Fanatics back from, G, uh, from eBay six years ago, seven years ago, we knew from day one that Amazon was going to be this incredibly successful company. I believe that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and really my belief, it just kind of cut through it, is there's no way to win in e-commerce against Amazon or in, in China against Alibaba if you're not completely differentiated. So the whole Fanatics model is all about designing, developing, selling directly to the consumer own products, and it's really what we call v-commerce or vertical commerce. So for me, Amazon's success is a huge benefit to us. And we built a differentiated model to make sure that Amazon's going to continue to kill it and go from a trillion dollars to a much bigger business over time from a value perspective and also from a retail perspective, but that we're going to continue to have huge growth because of the differentiation that we have. So going back a little bit earlier for people in the audience who aren't familiar, can you talk a little bit about the origin behind Fanatics and how you came yeah. to, you know, it's, it's a cool story. Sure. So I started a company called um, GSI Commerce in 1999. It became uh, really the largest provider of e-commerce services and infrastructure to big retailers, big brands around the world. So companies like Ralph Lauren, Dick Sporting Goods, GNC, uh, worked with my old company to, to own and operate and to, really, to, to, to run their e-commerce business and do the digital marketing services. So Fanatics was part of uh, GSI Commerce. So in 2011, um, GSI was acquired by eBay for $2.4 billion. And they really want the services business because they want the big merchants mm -hmm. to come to join the eBay marketplace and to really work together. And so they didn't want to have um, the other businesses, the inventory-owned businesses. So we bought back Fanatics and Rue La La and ShopRunner from eBay in 2011. And the, the business in uh, the year before was only a $250 million business. So mm -hmm. Fanatics in 2010 was a $250 million business. Today it's a $2.3 billion business. We think it's gonna be a $10 billion business over the next decade because of the differentiation of the business. It's all about v-commerce and vertical commerce. So SoftBank invested, was part of, uh, led around for a yeah. billion dollars a year ago valuing you at 4.5 billion, like, was that, you know, I, I understand that the sports market is huge, but are partnerships with sports leagues, you know, going to help you realize a billion dollar investment, or do you kind of have to expand beyond sports merchandise? No, we, look, we, as I just said, we think the sports market is enormous, and we think there's a bunch of potential beyond the sports market. So just in the sports industry alone, we've already gone from a quarter of a billion dollars to $2.3 billion. We see a very clear path to $10 billion, and we think that will be one of the most valuable consumer companies in the world as we take this as a vertical model, uh, which is, again, very differentiated from Amazon. What people don't really get is when you go to Amazon, it's an incredible business. They're selling other people's products. That's what Amazon's all about. That's what Alibaba is all about. If you're trying to do the same thing as Amazon or Alibaba, so you're selling other people's merchandise, you're going to die. You have no chance to be successful. Um, for me, it's all about having this completely differentiated business, and that's why we have so much potential within the sports vertical, and over time, we think we can take this to other verticals as well. So what's, what's revolutionary about that concept, though? Because, you know, say, say J. Crew was a billion-dollar business. They're selling their own products online. Like, what, what, what does the vertical commerce platform really matter? Is it, is it just leveraging the advantages of the web that you know, the, the legacy businesses haven't? Yeah, so, so I'd say the biggest thing is the exclusivity of what you're selling. So you told me you grew up in, in Indianapolis. If you're a big Colts fan and you want to go out and buy a jersey from that team or, or you, you're a Pacers fan, you want to buy a, a hoodie for the Pacers, you're not going to go buy something else. So if you have exclusive, unique merchandise, then consumers and fans come to you to buy that merchandise. And that's very different from, hey, I'm going to choose between a Nike or an Adidas pair of sneakers. So, you know, when um, football kicks off tonight and I'm back in Philadelphia for the Eagles playing the Atlanta Falcons, if you want to buy a Carson Wentz jersey, then you're going to come to buy that Carson Wentz jersey. And everything we do is about delivering to the fan, you know, whatever product they want, you know, every size, color, gender, whatever you may want for, for a fan. 
So if I go to Amazon and search for Colts jersey, I'll probably see some stuff. So what, what's, the, what's the unique? You, you, you'll you see a lot less than you think, to okay. be honest. Yeah, I, I'd say most of the products that we sell are not available at other big marketplaces like an Amazon. I'd say when we measure our assortment and we look, um, they carry a very small percentage of the products that we, ever, that we carry. And that's why fans come to us to buy the products. If it was commonly available at, at Amazon, there'd be no reason for us to be. Um, we offer an incredible selection. We have the speed and agility. Because we're vertical, something happens tonight and great, and, you know, a great play happens in the game. We can make a t-shirt around that great play and sell it immediately because we're manufacturing it on demand. So our whole business is about taking the content in sports and using that to program the merchandise really on a minute by minute basis based on what happens in a game, what's okay. hot, what's not hot. Okay, so when, when, you, when you bought Fanatics uh, and, and the other properties back from, from eBay, was there this idea that, you know, like how soon after were you like, okay, we're gonna get into manufacturing? B to be honest, the idea was before we bought the business back. Okay. So what we really bought from eBay was a completely different business than, than, than today. I think Fanatics in 2011 was really the Zappos of the licensed sports industry. And what that means is we were selling other people's merchandise. Today, the biggest thing we sell is our own product. And if it's not our own product, then it's um, merchandise that's mostly exclusive and not made available through other um, online marketplaces. Mm -hmm. All right, so and we had that strategy, to be clear, okay. from, day, you know, from day one. That was kind of where we started from. Okay, but for like, in terms of you know, growing to that $10 billion business, is that tapping the partnerships more than you, that you already have, or is sure, that you sure. know, grabbing you know, football leagues across the world? Like yeah, so, so we have great growth in our existing business. So if you look at how's the NFL growing, how's Major League Baseball growing, how's the NBA growing, we have incredible growth within, within the sports we're in. In addition, we're, we're now growing the business globally. We're growing um, you know, throughout the world. Soccer is a very big business for us and growing very fast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we just um, we launched with Formula One recently. So, I mean, we're growing in, in, in many geographies throughout the world. But there's also incredible growth. I mean, I looked uh, this morning, our NFL business year to date is up 35%. Okay. Okay. So in our biggest business, our most mature business, a business that people like to talk about negative headlines, we're up 35% year to date. So no one's burning, they're not buying them just to burn the jerseys? <laughs> but if they, if they watch, that's fine, but no, they're not. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about the, this, this stuff happening with Nike? Does, does it, you know, does them kind of taking a stand on an issue like you know, seem like a, a good business decision for them, you think? Look, Nike's a really smart company, and they know their consumers really well, and they made a decision that said that they may alienate a small percentage of older customers that don't spend a lot of money mm -hmm. to endear themselves to a younger customer, which is who their target demographic is, and I think it was a bold, aggressive, and smart move. I mean, to me, like, much respect. Why, why, why isn't Nike approaching, you know, a model similar? more similar to Fanatics. Yeah, we have an incredible business partnership with Nike. We work very closely together. So we've now, and this, we, we announced this a few months ago, Nike used to do everything in the NFL, and then we together created a better business model with the NFL ourselves and Nike, mm -hmm. where Nike's really the marketing and exposure partner. So you see them on the field, they're kind of the marketing partner. It gives them a great halo effect to sell more Nike product. But for us, we make everything Nike in the NFL. So when you buy a Nike jersey from Fanatics, or you buy from Dick's Sporting Goods, um, that jersey starting in 2020 will be manufactured by Fanatics, of course, under the Nike brand. Okay. So we make Nike merchandise, we make Under Armour merchandise, um, we make merchandise with, with, under most brands, but it still has the verticality that allows us to, to best service the fan and it'd be the best model for really everybody involved. Is there, is there any dream of pumping a bunch of money into marketing and branding and having Fanatics be a top? So you, really the way we think about it is Nike, Adidas, Under Armour, these are really performance brands. They're the brand, you know, that, that's what they are. They're a performance brand for us. We're really the brand of the fan. So Fanatics brand, number one, is a very well-known um, site. It's also, we, we make tens of millions of pieces of apparel, but we're, we're really a fan company. We think of ourselves as the brand for the fan. Okay. So Fanatics isn't the only property that's part of Kinetic. Rula La, Shoprunner, uh, you know, I think I was watching an interview that you had done, and what's interesting about Shoprunner is that you said it was, you know, one of the, one of the few alternatives on the web for Amazon Prime. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So Shoprunner is a business that we started at GSI in 2009. It really started because we were good listeners. What we heard from our retailers is like, hey, how are you going to help me deal with this Amazon Prime problem? And after maybe the hundredth person asked me, we're like, well, we kind of got to deal with this thing. And, um, you know, we built this starting in 2009. Today it's got 
um, millions of members spending billions of dollars that really concentrate their spend around Amazon, I'm, I'm sorry, around ShopRunner merchants. So we've got more than 150 merchants. You get unlimited two-day shipping from ShopRunner, and it's a great service for a consumer because you're getting unlimited two-day shipping at no incremental cost, mm -hmm. and it's um, a great benefit to the merchants because it's really driving uh, billions of dollars of business who these members concentrate their spend through ShopRunner merchants. And then are they, they're turning to you just because it's, you're taking like a more conservative revenue slice? Uh, we take, we, we, the way our model works is the merchant pays the cost of the two-day shipping, okay. and then we generally take, uh, depending on the category, between um, 4 and 5% of revenue. Okay. Um, would you say that Fanat so Fanatics has been growing incredibly quickly? Yeah, it's over the 10x the size, say, than when we bought it uh, seven years ago. And we think it's going to, you know, we think the growth has just started. The thing that's so exciting about Fanatics for us it's gone from 250 million to 2.3 billion dollars, and we feel like we're just getting started. We think there's so much growth ahead. We think there's so much growth in sports. We think we can service the fans so much better with a direct-to-consumer model. We always have what the fan wants. So we think there's incredible growth there, and we think there's incredible growth for ShopRunner as well, which has also gone from a few hundred million dollar business to billions of dollars in GMV. Do you think that there's a, a point where they kind of converge, and you can take your own v-commerce part, but you're just a part of a network of sites that you know? alongside very like well-known brands already uh, our shop runner and fanatics always going to be independent entities you think yeah we look at our three companies as very independent okay um fanatics has its own set of investors it's got its own ceo it's run separately same story for shop runner and same story for rule on guilt which is a separate company as well okay okay you also own guilt yes okay um Talk, talk a little bit about Rulala and Guilt. Like, who, what? Those are obviously serving different audiences than Fanatics is. Like, Absolutely. How do you how do you maintain kind of a uh, unified vision of the e-commerce world with a? You know, you know, for me, I we we what we've really learned is to have three separate teams with three separate CEOs is the most effective way to run the business because each business is completely different. So I think where I have is I think a common perspective that there's you know, two incredible e-commerce companies selling physical merchandise in the world, which is really Amazon and, 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 and Alibaba. And so I think the perspective that I have from my respect for those companies allows us to make sure we have a strategy that's very insulated and differentiated from what they do. Again, you know, I've had the core belief. I sat up in 2004, 2005, when Amazon was a 20 or $30 billion business, and I told our merchants at my old company that Amazon would be the biggest company in retail over time. People mm -hmm. said to me I was nuts at that point. Okay. And now it's clear, uh, even though Walmart's still bigger in GMV, yeah. it's, it's clear that you know, Amazon will be the, you know, the biggest, certainly in North America, the biggest retail company in many places in the, in the world. So I think the respect and understanding for how good Amazon and Alibaba are lets you say, how am I gonna do something that's, that's very different? Because if you don't, you have no chance of being successful. It's interesting when you talk about the vertical commerce model because you know when I, when I hear it, it's, it seems like the same thing that a small business would say. And obviously, small businesses aren't raising a billion dollars from SoftBank. So, like, so, so here's what I think vertical commerce is. When I look at a company like Lululemon, okay, they own their own brand. It's a direct-to-consumer brand. Mm -hmm. The difference is, 80% of their sales go through physical retail stores. For us, 80% of our sales go through e-commerce. So if you could start a new brand today. You'd say, hey, I want to be vertical because I want to control the relationship directly with the consumer. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I want to do it through e-commerce because that's the most efficient vehicle. So all we've done is taken the model of an H&M or a Zara or a, um, or a or Lululemon and said, we're going to take that same vertical model, but we're going to do it primarily through e-commerce. So do you think for, you know, maybe for startup founders who are looking to get into the e-commerce space and already have a, have a product, do you think that your success... Uh, your successful model tr can translate to them, or is it something that you kind of already have to have a pretty uh, heavy infrastructure? Well, in look, w one thing about e-commerce is scale is very important. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have scale, you can't be successful. So I'd say what I always say to someone in e-commerce is how big can it be, and what are the order economics? If it can't be a big enough business, and the order economics don't show you that you can make a lot of you know, contribution margin from it, mm -hmm. you should, again, give up and not waste your time. Okay. Right. Like, I mean, I'm pretty, you know, straightforward to say, I think I see people come to me with e-commerce ideas all the time. Like, this won't work. It's not, you know, the order economics aren't there or it can't be big enough. You have to be able to answer those questions. Okay. It's, it's crazy, the scale, because, you know, it's sitting at $4.5 billion valuation and still Amazon at a trillion. Like, it, you know, when you, when you look at that, are you, are you just 
do you feel like Amazon could decide to make a play in this direction, or would that just completely be out of character for them or Alibaba to do? You know, I think what's very unique about our business, it's all about the partnerships and the acquisitions that we have. These are very, um, uh, the acquisition of rights that we have. These are very long-term partnerships. So okay. our average partnership with a league is probably 15 years long, and we have tons of exclusivity in the rights, and we have tremendous scale. So I don't, so I think we are very differentiated. Again, I have incredible respect and admiration for Amazon, same thing for Alibaba. Um, but again, we're selling different merchandise that's okay. not commonly available. So I think, you know, Amazon's got a big, big business and they're growing by, you know, Amazon's probably growing by like an entire target per year. Sure. Um, so I don't think they're looking and saying, hey, in 15 years from now, how do we try to get all the rights that Fanatics has today and build the scale that we don't have in this category that's very specialized? Okay, okay. All right, now switching gears entirely. Uh, caught you on Jimmy Fallon a couple days ago. You're sitting next to rapper Meek Mill, and you're talking about criminal justice reform, and that's very different from what, you know. That's I, not like the same thing as like selling a jersey. To yeah, not, not quite, not quite. So yeah. tell me about how you got involved with criminal justice reform and how that moment on stage happened. Yeah, so for me, um, it was completely by accident. Um, I never thought it would happen. But um, Meek Mill, you know, was, before any of this happened, was one of my um, closest friends. We had met four or five years ago at an NBA All-Star game. You know, I'm one of the owners of the Sixers. He started coming to our games. And um, I remember maybe a year into knowing him, maybe we'd hung out 10 times, mostly at our games. I said, hey, I'm going to um, this place called the Borgata. It was a casino in, in New Jersey. I said, do you want to come with me? He said, I can't go. And I looked at him like, like, what do you mean you can't go? He's like, I don't have permission. I'm like, do you need permission from your mother to, go, to, 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 yeah. to come with me? Uh. He's, like, he's like, bro, I'm on probation. I'm like, okay, um, so how does that work? You can't, you can't go from Philadelphia across the bridge to, the guy said, no, I need to get permission from the court. I'll never forget that. So that was like my first kind of understanding of his situation. Mm -hmm. And then we had become, you know, much better friends over the next couple of years. You know, we'd, you know, been on, you know, you know, dozens of trips together, you know, coming to our games all the time, you know, at my house a lot, doing stuff together, you know, kind of, you know, he become friendly with many of my friends. And then um, last year he was around all the time. And I was like, 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 bro, what are you doing? Like, you know, kind of like, yeah. you know, like, like, get a job. He's like, Michael, <laughs> this isn't funny. Like, I'm not allowed to I'm leave. I'm like, well, how are you performing? He's like, sure. that's why I'm around all the time. I want, they won't let me leave Philadelphia. I'm like, huh. okay, this, this, now I'm like, this makes no sense. So long story short, he had last year two um, very minor incidents, uh, what you call, say police contact. One was um, he popped a wheelie on a motorcycle and he put it on Instagram. And a day and a half later, 21 police officers came and arrested him for reckless endangerment. And that alone was enough to give him a probation violation. So um, the judge in Philadelphia called him in for a probation violation. And, um, you know, I wrote a letter on his behalf. And I, really, I was like, this can't possibly be an issue. Sure. Anyway, long story short, um, I was, he, he was going to court. He was worried about it. I said, I'm going to come with you. Mm -hmm. And I went in the courtroom. And this is my first time kind of in a courtroom for anything like yeah. this. You yeah. know, I don't even think I'd been for a traffic ticket. Yeah. Um, and I watched the probation officer get up and say... Um, Meek Mills, you know, his real, real name is Rob Williams. He's an incredible citizen. He's done everything we ask. We recommend no sentence. Then I watched the district attorney get up and say, we recommend no sentence. I turned over to the lawyers. I'm like, why are we here? And the lawyers said, I don't know, but in 0% of cases you get sentenced when the probation officer and district attorney recommend no sentence. An hour later, the judge sentenced him to two to four years in state penitentiary. Hmm. And that for me was a life-changing event. I yeah. saw one of my closest friends being taken away from his family and his friends right to jail. Yeah. And he called me that night. He called me an hour later from jail. He's like, I told you. I'm like, you told me what? He's like, I always told you there were two Americas. You always told me that I was wrong. He, said, he used to always say to me, Michael, there's, there's America and there's black America. And I say like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. life is great. Like, you're wrong. Like, look, you're killing it. And that's when I realized he was completely, um, he was completely right and I was completely wrong. And at that point... Um, I said to him, I'm going to do everything I can at any cost, at, no matter what it takes to get you out of prison. Yeah. And then Jay-Z, um, who was his management company, um, his partner, Desiree Perez, um, was coincidentally sitting next to me. And we kind of said, like, look, we're going to do this together. We're not going to stop. And, and uh, fortunately, the Supreme Court released him on 
bail about six months later. So how did you translate that whole situation into, you know, something where you can actually help people in that same situation? Yeah. And, and what, what, are, what are your companies doing specifically? Yes. Yeah, so for, for me, the first thing was I understood a problem that I never understood before because I had 0.0, .0 awareness of the problems of the criminal justice system before that happened. Um, once we knew that he was getting out of prison soon because we knew, you know, we'd proven that he didn't do the original crime he was charged of and we knew that this was going to get resolved or, you know, partially resolved, we started saying every day, we're like, we got to help the other people that are stuck in this similar situation who aren't famous, who don't have friends, who have a lot of power or money. Sure. And so, um, you know, within a couple months of his situation, we started socializing, let's start a criminal justice foundation that can really help. There's 6.7 million people today um, that are stuck within the criminal justice system. And I think if any of us took a logical approach to what we think makes sense, you know, we want murderers in jail, we want, you know, violent criminals in jail, we want people that do really bad things totally. in jail, but we don't want someone who was on probation and smoked weed to go back to prison, or he was late for his meeting with his probation right. officer to go back to prison. And I, I think the numbers should probably be half. So what we've done is we're putting together an incredible group of people. We'll announce it uh, later this fall, but at you know, minimal, it's myself, it's Meek, it's Robert Kraft, or some other really big and important um, you know, contributors to this who are going to put not only a lot of capital into this, but really care deeply about reforming the criminal justice system, sure. who have a real platform to help reform it. So you know, our goal is really simple. We want to get a million people out of the criminal justice system in the next five years. And over time, we'd like to see it cut in half. And by the way, in America, we have a rate of incarceration of five times higher than the entire rest of the world together. Mm -hmm. So this system is completely broken. It needs to be fixed. So we talked a little, a little bit about reentry. Uh, yeah. What's Fanatics doing particularly? So it, it's one of the great things. Uh, you know, we have 8,000 employees at our company. As I called the CEO of Rulala Guilt last week, and I said, "Hey, I got an idea." And I mm -hmm. just talked to the CEO of Fanatics, and I said, "You know, we've got." You know, between the two companies, 8,000 collective employees, there are 750,000 people who get out of prison and get out of jail each year. Mm -hmm. how, how, how do we create a pilot for how do we help people transition um, from prison and jail to work on our companies? I've challenged each of our companies to start creating great opportunities for people coming out of prison and jail and help them kind of reenter. And what I've learned through my uh, research is in many times, these are some of your best associates. They, they, they grow. They're incredibly loyal. So I think it's a big opportunity. And for me, one of the things I want to do at the foundation is how do we help um, hundreds of thousands of people get um, jobs coming out of prison and jail uh, each year. And I think Fanatics and uh, Rulala and Guilt are a great place to start to create some of those sure. opportunities and do it on a pilot basis. Very cool. Well, it's fantastic work and a lot of success, it seems like, also. Great to have you on stage. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. Right.